Okay. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. We'll see you there. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonia Bertolino. I am uh, here just to introduce Professor Forrest Schall for this, Forrest Schull for this important uh, keynote. Uh, and uh, I give the, the floor to Forrest, please. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today um, for many reasons, actually. But as the Computer Society president, I think one of the best parts of my job uh, is that I get to meet a lot of our award winners uh, that we're honoring over the course of the year uh, for contributions to the community and to the to the science that we do. Uh, and it's a special pleasure when I happen to know the award uh, winner uh, and have worked with them over the course of our careers together. So we're here today to honor uh, Professor Dieter Rombach uh, as the winner of our Harlan Mills Award presentation. First, let me tell you a little bit about the, the award. Uh, it's named and it's established in 1999 uh, it's established to honor the memory of Harlan Mills, a uh, mathematician and software engineering pioneer. And I think one of the reasons why he was such a um, noteworthy person to, to honor with our award name is that he himself made longstanding contributions to the science, uh, to the engineering, to the, the larger community of software engineering. And so having established the award in 1999, we use that as a model to uh, honor others of our colleagues that have made similar long-standing contributions on many dimensions. And from that point of view, I think it's very um, uh, just wonderful that this year's awardee is Professor Dieter Rombach. Uh, the award, I have to read the award uh, notation here, for contributions in leadership in research, in teaching, and technology transfer in the area of empirical software engineering. So Dieter has had a long and storied career. Um, as I progress in my own career, by the way, I should say that, that what I find is that I admire more and more the folks that have made contributions uh, both on the research side and on the industry application side. Uh, and Dieter really exemplifies the folks that have balanced on both sides of that, uh, both sides of that chasm, if you will, because it's not an easy job uh, to be able to work effectively in both communities. Uh, Dieter has had a long-standing um, relationship with the University of Kaiserslautern. Uh, he's been the senior uh, senior research professor there since uh, October 2018. But at least what I remember Dieter more for is for all of his work with the Fraunhofer Center. Um, Dieter has been an integral part of the, the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Germany. Uh, he, uh, when I read some of the background on the Yesa website, it said that uh, Dieter convinced the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft that they needed a center dedicated to empirical software engineering and knowing how persuasive and how persistent Dieter can be when he knows that he needs something done uh, I felt a little twinge of sympathy for the the Fraunhofer folks at that moment I have to say but um, I've been really pleased actually in many ways to see what Dieter has been able to do over the course of that time with the Fraunhofer I do feel like many of us as researchers in software engineering uh, much of what we produce tends to be somewhat ephemeral and so we, you know, we, we produce papers, and if we're lucky, other people read them and cite them. Uh, if we're really lucky, we produce software that other people use and get some utility out of and contribute back to. But what really impressed me, having seen Dieter's uh, progression over time, is that he created something very, very physical. He created a, a, an organization and a center that brings together hundreds of uh, really great workers in empirical software engineering. Uh, he's created a you know, a physical building that goes along with it that houses that and, pro and provides a really uh, physical and concrete reminder of the community that's been developed there. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, having worked with Peter, having visited Kaiserslautern on several occasions over the course of my career, um, what what was created there in that organization in Kaiserslautern, I think was kind of the, dare I say, the, the spiritual home of the empirical software engineering community. That is, I, I know many of us working in the field have have transitioned through, you know, everyone has good and, uh, and affectionate memories of our time there working with the center, working with that critical mass of knowledge that Dieter helped bring together. Uh, and I really appreciate, of course, where I knew Dieter most directly was when we created the uh, Fraunhofer Center in Maryland in the United States, uh, which applies that same model to work that we were doing there, mostly for government, you know, but also for industry in the U.S. And so it's been wonderful like I said, to have been able to see very concretely over the course of my own career, uh, this community come together, um, this community spread around the world, and to make such a difference and an impact in the way that software engineering is done. So I had the opportunity after I found out that Dieter was the award winner to look at his nomination package. 
and I, I was really impressed with uh, several of the endorsements. I think that one of the phrases that came up over and over again was the idea of a, of a paradigm shift in software engineering as a result of Dieter's work. And uh, you know, I, I think for many of us, uh, having been there and early on trying to do empirical software engineering papers and working to develop the, the engineering and the science and what makes an empirical uh, study a good one or not, uh, and having hashed that all out. And now to see today that empirical studies are more and more of just the natural way that research gets done in software engineering. Uh, that you know, it's, it's less and less likely that you see papers anymore that are published and it's just a good idea without any kind of empirical backing to it. And so I think for all those contributions and for being persuasive and for moving, helping the field come together uh, and rally around this community so that we now have something that's much more of a engineering field for software engineering, you know, where we understand that new technologies and new ideas are great, but what we really need to do is to have a, a rigorous and, a, and a, um, impactful discussion around how, you know, what kind of a difference they make in the real world and how we can, uh, how we can have those discussions based on data as opposed to anecdote. I, I feel a profound sense of gratitude uh, to Dieter and the work that he's done. So I, I will just stop there briefly. I, I um, want to turn things over to Dieter, who's the person that we're all really here to see, of course. Uh, but just end up by again saying uh, thank you, Dieter. Uh, thank you for the contributions you've made to the community. Uh, thank you for the, the contributions you've made to my own uh, personal career. Uh, I know that many of us, when we talk about the work that was done and, and the, the goodness that came out of all that work, uh, focus on not only the the empirical and the scientific contribution, but also just talk about the ability to, to work with some of the key personalities, including Dieter, with great affection. And I think that's a great testament to the, the work that he's led and the work that he's inspired. And so with that, uh, Dieter, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, Forrest, uh, for your nice and kind words. Um, good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues from the uh, software engineering community. It's my great pleasure to accept the 2021 Harlan uh, Mills Award without words. The pleasure is truly special because two of my main mentors throughout my, my career are directly involved. Harlan Mills, of course, who taught me the difference between science and engineering style software engineering and whom I had the honor to share an office at the University of Maryland with for several years and Victor Basili, who nominated me for this award and who taught me everything about measurement and empirics and whom I had the honor to collaborate with at the University of Maryland for eight years and uh, thereafter. Um, if you get such an award, and I can truly say this award ranks highest among all the rewards I have received over my uh, career, uh, it makes you think and look back a little bit on your career. And today, I want you to join me on a quick journey of my own career in software engineering and how it was influenced by Harlan Mills and Victor Basili. Also today, I want to focus on Harlan Mills, um, the name patron uh, of this award. I will start with a short summary a, of uh, the challenges in software engineering, which, which raised my interest as an educated mathematician early on in my career which resulted in a set of principles which I truly believe on in that they are important to become a real software engineer, not the technologies which are changing over time, but some of these underlying principles. And all of this guided me and my research, teaching and technology transfer throughout my career. Then I will discuss uh, briefly some of these principles which are organized according to development methods related to life cycle processes, as well as measurement and empirics. Towards the end, I want to highlight Harlan Mills' contributions to our community in general and his impact on my professional and personal uh, career. And I will close with a brief outlook and some general thanks. So let me um, highlight first my view of what I mean with true software engineering uh, and challenges and what motivated my career in software engineering and how it did influence my life. The next uh, graph I will present is kind of in a very short synopsis, my career. I started observing that uh, there are two crucial shortcomings in our area. There are certainly more, but two uh, crucial ones. The first the lack of scalable engineering style software engineering methods. And secondly, 
the lack of quantitative means for setting goals, performing quality control, performing empirical studies. And, and doing that not only in a laboratory environment, but also in real settings. The true reflections of these two deficiencies are captured in these two graphs, that we still today work with systems that over time are so distorted that nobody can comprehend them anymore. And secondly, the kind of rework we are having in software development projects, which basically reflect the fact that we have lost intellectual control over the development of very large software systems. And the solution uh, from my conviction is truly the uh, acceptance of practical software engineering. And that's science-based software engineering methods. So we need specific engineering methods that can be applied by practitioners, but there has to be underlying science. And part of the science is also the science of measurement. So this is the impact uh, on me from Basili and Mills. And just a few highlights, I believe that some of the keys for success, practical success, is that we have understandable science and theory. That's why I kind of fell in love with Hall and Mills' approach to functional semantics, that we have scalability, dealing with complexity uh, in specific ways. Um, and Hall and Mills has developed his approach of box structures to do that. And there is not only the handling and the scalability with respect to complexity, but also the um, scalability with respect to formality. So I can use the same uh, approach in a more formal or less formal way, depending on the yeah, criticality of the software I'm developing. And of course, also in the bottom part, uh, we had to learn how to motivate the use of metrics by goals. That's the uh, goal question metric paradigm. And we had to learn how to apply a continuous improvement based on data, which is the quality improvement paradigm experience factory. And all this learning from Milton Basili has uh, had a tremendous impact on my career and both, all three, education, research, and practice. Forrest has highlighted a few of them. So let's think about essential principles for the engineering of software. First of all, when we look at methods, they need to be guided by sound engineering principles. For instance, as I already mentioned, understandable or natural semantics, but complexity uh, um, um, mitigating uh, approaches like divide and conquer and traceability. And all this would allow us to scale software engineering. That means to build larger software systems uh, still with individual steps that are complexity bound. Um, the same, that's what we want to avoid. The same applies to life cycle processes. They need to be executed according to misc mitigating principles. And we have approaches like incremental or agile. We have the use of early inspections, all aimed at minimizing rework. So we don't have these uh, um, pictures where like requirements defects here in red are found all the way through the development cycle uh, until the very end. And that's very costly and not uh, uh, very helpful. And finally, measurement and empirics. Um, we needed to make sure that this could be uh, applied in a way that people understand why we collect data. That's the goal orientation. And that we were able to create repeatable processes by means of continuous improvement. I will not talk today about another important topic that, that is in software engineering, we have to accept that there is an accepted body of knowledge that we have to start from and not allow every organization to come up with its own ways to uh, build software. Now, in a little bit more detail, the engineering principles for uh, development methods. The right-hand picture is one of my key pictures every student and practitioner has to see when I'm teaching or training. It is basically a product-oriented model, a product model along which you can define the need for all of these principles. And it's independent of life cycle models. At, in the end, all these artifacts have to exist. And in the end, all the relations in terms of correctness and reliability have to be uh, achieved. So the first thing I would like to talk about is the first principle um, is um, natural um, um, description models. 
which are easy to understand. Uh, I've learned over many years that formality is not the problem for practitioners, but it's unnatural formality. Things that makes them think uh, differently than they are used to. Therefore, I liked uh, functional semantics, Mill style, as it is based on elements that programmers naturally used to reason about their programs when they debug. Uh, functions as mappings between two sets of variable value vectors is something you practically apply when you debug software. And this is actually, when you look at functional semantics here, just a quick excerpt of definitions uh, according to Harl Mills. And I want to focus on uh, the uh, assignment statement. It looks formal in the, and it is formal, of course, but it's natural in the sense that it describes exactly what a, what a practitioner understands that what's being changed by this statement is that the state after execution is the same state as it is the state before execution, except that the variable on the left hand side of the assignment has the new uh, value. And so when we do this, um, um, we apply just a more formal representation of the natural understanding of programmers and software developers to defining uh, this semantics. Uh, of course, uh, in practice, we are not using this formal definition. We, we use the short uh, version, the short notion on the left-hand side. Uh, but the point is, whenever you need to, you can actually verify that the program is uh, uh, behaving according to its defined semantics. The, I wouldn't say more important, but from a complexity point of view, important aspects are divide and conquer and level completeness. Uh, only if we have these two principles adhered to in any technology, only then complex problems can be solved with intellectual control. Because if it's larger and more complex, we just need more steps of the same bound by complexity and not more complex development uh, steps. And so I want to lead you to some very simple example. The first one is one I always tell my students that they all know what divide and conquer as well as uh, level completeness is. Why is it that on the left-hand side, the division in, of Arabic numbers can be done in any length of the dividend by any, uh, um, I would say, elementary school kid? It is because divide and conquer is applied. So you take independent of the length of the dividend, the this red mark part, guess what it is divided by 12, and the guess is one, and level completeness allows you that you can immediately check that your guess was right. So you don't continue and find out at the very end that you are on the wrong track. So separate it into individual steps. So here is the second step. Obviously, I mean, that's uh, very trivial. But in each step, you have to guess one number. Basically, uh, in the second one, 82 defined, uh, divided by 12. So assuming the guess is 6 and you can validate that this is correct because the um, uh, subtraction uh, achieves 10, which is less than 12, so you have guessed correctly. So the creative step at each level is about the same complexity. And if I increase the dividend on the left side to 100 digits, I just need more steps, but each step is of equal complexity. So these principles apply. And I don't have to discuss, think about how to do this with Roman numbers on the right-hand side. It's obviously not possible because here a division does not include or is not based on the principles of divide and conquer and level completeness. Now, the same is now true for functional semantics. And I'm using here an example from a book, uh, from a, a paper from Marvin Selkowitz. And so here you can read this red specification. And the idea is to apply stepwise functional refinement via functionally defined program operators. In this simple case, it's just sequence, alternative, and iteration until you end up with functions that define the semantics of basic program elements. For instance, the previously discussed uh, assignment statement. So what you see here is one refinement step. In this case, the while operator uh, has been used for refinement. and the good thing is it's also level complete. You can at, at this level already verify 
that the specification H1, the function H1, uh, is as body of this while statement. This uh, is uh, consistent, is correct relative to specification H. Now, again, the simple example of uh, Arabic number division is uh, understandable to everyone, uh, every student I had, and now we are trying to do the same thing for programming. Now, here is the next step. In this particular step, then we have applied uh, refinement in terms of sequence. So H1 is refined into um, the sequence of H11 and H12. And of course, you could again verify this because it's level complete before you continue. Now, this means if you use this opening the next box and refining it, opening the next book, refining it, and always uh, verifying it, you could actually build very large programs um, um, without falling into the trap of complexity. By the way, it's not necessarily true that you have to do this top down, this refinement. You can also start somewhere in between, bottom up, and then put the program together. In the end, each refinement step is of a certain level of complexity, and each refinement step can be verified. Uh, Harlan Mills has expanded this into his so called box structures, which are basically engineering abstractions, which can be applied to modules without state and with state. So, more function like modules or more abstract data type modules. Now, here is from my learning over my career are the seven things I would like to have available as information and characteristics as principles for the building, for methods of building every large software system. I mentioned a little bit about the first three. Important is certainly uh, also the two horizontal vertical traceability with respect um, uh, to software systems. Vertical means that between different levels of abstraction, they are consistent with each other. That's basically the verification condition. And horizontal traceability is like when you think of UML, is the traceability between um, different model types at the same level. And as we all know, UML has improved certainly the vertical traceability, but has opened up the challenge of maintaining horizontal traceability as you develop or change large software systems. Now, let me move on to uh, the next level, uh, which is uh, life cycle processes. And I will speed some of this a little bit up because the first two principles, I've numbered the them after seven, the seven first ones, eight and nine, are very obvious. I think nobody would uh, counter the argument that it's better to do prevention or early defect detection to avoid that lack, that, that lagging of a software defect all the way to the end. I think the main challenge is if you observe something like this. So what you see here is like in color. The, this is from a real project, by the way. The red uh, defects are requirements defects, and you can see a certain number is recovered during the requirements phase, but others are being uh, uh, slipped into the system all the way to uh, final stages. And how can you prevent something like this? The only way is to actually apply more rigorous uh, inspections. And that's also a message from the work of uh, Harlan Mills, but also validated empirically uh, by the work of um, Victor Basilio. Now, this is very important because in practical large projects I have been watching, I have never seen a large project where the rework was less than 50%. Rework is everything to recover defects after the phase they were introduced. And that defect is typically more than 50%. And that is, of course, a, a sign that we have also lost some level of control, intellectual control, over these software development processes. Now, the solutions are typically that, except for situations where you know exactly the requirements, have done them before many times, you would go for something like incremental or agile, um, approaches to reduce the risk of development. I mean, you probably remember the old question, is there a best life cycle model? And we have learned there is no best. The best for a given project is the one that limits the risk of rework 
so that the success of a project is not in danger. And here I'm using my second picture, which is basically saying the big box is a complex software development process over time. And you can modularize it along the time dimension. Then we create phases, requirements phase, design phase, etc. And you can modularize it along the requirements domain. So we have increments one, two, etc. The difference between incremental development and agile is basically that in agile, we apply agile development mostly when there is increments open. So we don't have a complete set of requirements, but we are still exploring the requirement space. But in the end, a software lifecycle process is good or best for a given project if each of these boxes does not allow more rework then i can tolerate to have a successful project yeah so if you would just have the overall box that would mean and you would only check at the very end of the project whether the software adheres to the requirements you wanted to adhere to then there is a potential that you have to rework a large part of that and that would kill the system uh, the project uh, in these boxes we assume that the maximum rework is not large enough to actually put a project at risk. And so for each project I'm discussing with students or I'm discussing with practitioners when they give me a certain uh, life cycle model, which typically includes both aspects, the modularization according to time, into phases, and the modularization in terms of requirements domain, uh, by the way, for um, for uh, agile and incremental projects, we have learned that in early increments, we should address the non-functional requirements because otherwise you have a too unstable architecture because non-functional requirements have a cross-cutting effect on architectures. You might have to overhaul everything. Yeah, And then we discuss basically what's the maximum risk given uh, your current structure. And if the risk at some level is too small, we have to further divide uh, the life cycle process basically divide one phase into two sub phases or create smaller increments or sprints, depending on which notion you want to use. Now, um, the overall set here of principles, the first three I, I, I uh, at least touched on. All the rest is something that we also know from engineering, design for testability, design for modifiability, design for variant creation. This is something we have only learned in software engineering under the label of uh, product lines. And here we have a large effort going on at Fraunhofer IESA for many years. Uh, it was called the so-called pulse approach to software product lines. This has been, um, um, this has been, uh, recognized by having made it into the SEI Hall of Fame, which we view as uh, uh, um, international recognition. And from an engineering point of view, one specific thing is what you see here in green, that we actually apply commonality analysis between already existing systems or specifications as approximation of domain analysis, because domain analysis is something very hard because it really doesn't terminate. And so we used that approximation and suddenly we had a higher acceptance from practitioners than we had before because they knew how to approach it, take a, a set of past systems and future specifications, analyze the commonalities and variances, and that brings you into that area of identifying the commonalities for your uh, product line and what you need to deal with in uh, case of application engineering. Now, as you probably know, measurement empirics is the main part of my uh, uh, basic research in the past, uh, but I will not focus that much on this here today, uh, but mention a few principles. I think the first two, that everything is quantifiable, if not, it can be engineered, and that uh, we need to uh, uh, put analysis relative to the definition on scales and accuracy of data is obvious. But uh, one thing we have learned for acceptance uh, in real projects is that people only collect data rigorously if they know what they are used for, what the goals are, and uh, 
that this is something that they can benefit from. And this was the reason for defining the goal question metric paradigm, which I will not go into here, of course, um, because um, it, it looks simple. This was really a simple thing, but it had a tremendous impact on the practical application and acceptance of measurement in reality, not only because metrics are motivated by goals, but also because you can do a pre-evaluation. How should I interpret the data before you actually get into the costly process of data collection? And here we have, this is really uh, one of the things that we have, uh, I would say, improved significantly in the context of the Fraunhofer Institute. I found it after my return uh, to Germany. Now, the other thing just briefly mentioned, um, we know from engineering plan to check act, we know that this is not identically applicable to a design discipline like software development, but still we need something to uh, measurement based improve from project to project. And just so you have a picture, this is actually the uh, uh, graphical capture of this quality improvement paradigm and experience factory, which shows that from multiple project we learn we abstract commonalities and differences and make that available in future projects to guide based on based on best practices from the past. By the way, also here an experience from practice. Experiences derived in your own world from your own projects are much more accepted by practitioners than experiences that are infused from some kind of external environments. Now, I would like to uh, switch to uh, what Harlan Mills' contributions uh, were. Um, I think uh, it's all described already in um, the description of his award, because what he is basically um, standing for is impactful, sustained impactful contributions to software engineering, both practice and research and development and application of sound theory. So what I took most out of that is that sound theory and engineering approaches, approaches in practice are no contradiction, they are complementary. And as you could see from this semantic uh, approach, uh, uh, functional semantics, that's a fully rigorous mathematically defined scientific foundation, but it can be applied in an engineering style in terms of box structures and other kinds of approaches, as long as they also include divide and conquer and level completeness principles. So he actually laid the foundation for this kind of thinking, uh, science or theory-based uh, application of software with its functional uh, semantics approach, natural uh, semantics, scalable with respect to functionality and formality, level completeness, and also the box structures. There's also sequence-based specification and other techniques that adhere to these principles. Um, and he also uh, developed, it, it integrated them into motivating life cycle models. So for instance, the clean room approach he uh, also masterminded and developed is basically providing the motivation for applying early inspections. We have learned uh, in, um, in his, the work with him and Victor Bersilli at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center that people under project pressure don't do the inspections early on. Also, they theoretically know it's good because they believe that they can uh, um, resolve the problems during testing. And so he basically created a process which forces you to inspect the software manually by means of inspections before you can actually execute and test it. And once we, we, we used that clean room approach, people actually uh, created the positive results because they stuck to these inspections early on in the process to reduce rework. And he was also a partner in it, the empirical validation and improvement um, we did in the NASA uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. And finally, he also, took his results, packaged them for practitioners, and created a firm with the late Professor Jesse Poor to uh, consult with companies. By the way, maybe if Harlan Mills would have lived in Germany, he would certainly be a member of Fraunhofer. 
because that science, engineering, and then practice, that's exactly what Josef von Fraunhofer, the name patron of Fraunhofer stands for. He has done exactly the thing in optics, science contributions. Um, some people might know Fraunhofer spectral lines. In, he did applied engineering uh, contributions in optics, and then he developed devices, had a company to develop and sell devices to watch the stars, etc. So exactly the same kind of sequence, basic research engineering and practice as Harlan Mills did. And that's also why I, when I came back, uh, went to Fraunhofer. Now, a little bit about how he affected my life. <clears throat> there is a personal aspect. I think, first of all, due to the weekly meetings we had what, during the time we shared an office, he had a imp tremendous impact in terms of scientific integrity. He every week told me, don't jump on every new item, on every new challenge. Stay with what you believe is important. And the second thing, what he believed is important, and now I believe also, is that engineering and mathematical scientific basis are not contradictions, but they complement each other. In terms of research, I focused most of my research on scalable methods. That's systematic inspection uh, processes and software product lines, the SPALTs, and of course, uh, uh, moving in towards practical applicability, the approaches of GQM and quality, uh, quality improvement time paradigm and experience factory. In teaching, I established in Kaiserslautern the first introductory level course to freshmen where they did not program, but they started with understanding by means of analysis of existing programs to understand what makes programs hard and easy to understand. And only after that, we introduced them to the principles by stepwise refinement, how to build these uh, programs. And because they had experience first, that if certain principles are applied, it's easier to understand, they stuck with these principles. I certainly believe that if we don't start with understanding before construction, people will always develop their own approaches because they have no baseline to understand what's hard, what's easy. I'm specifically proud uh, in my academic education how many students I was able to yeah, yeah, incentivize to think similarly about 550 masters uh, students and 100 uh, PhDs. And now we have about six years or eight years ago, we started a continuing education masters for software engineering at our university, where we teach exactly the same kind of systematic engineering approaches. And last but not least, um, the introduction of formal inspections and other engineering approaches along these lines is the main business of Fraunhofer, so we had numerous projects and successes which have been published. And I think in terms of sustainability, Fraunhofer IESE is kind of the crown, the crown achievement. And I'm proud that even after I stopped about uh, four, three years ago, my successor, Peter Ligesmeyer, has led the institute to even more fame. Uh, just a quick mentioning of this book because this is something I wrote with a colleague from IBM, a late colleague from IBM, because we wanted to demonstrate that even in software engineering, there is a body of knowledge which you should not ignore. Uh, uh, and uh, it was amazing when we started this project, how many of these things, of these uh, body of knowledge items that have been proven to be successful, there actually exist. So is this important in the future? Where we have even more complex systems, my answer is clearly yes. We need even more rigor to main control in these so-called smart ecosystems, these tremendously complex systems with systems of systems, autonomous self-adaptions, etc. Uh, so the systems get more complex and we need even more rigor. And the toolbox of these principles I try to highlight is what I really believe that this is what every engineer needs to understand. Independent of process models and independent of technology curves, that's what carries you throughout your career. Technologies will change, process models will change, but the basic principle for maintaining intellectual controls on software systems and life cycle processes will never change. And if you may be able to understand that, you will be able to be successful. And Again, Harlan Mills and uh, Rick Basili laid the foundation. 
So I don't want to repeat all of this in detail. I'm deeply indebted to Harlan Mills. I've learned, by the way, besides the technical things, also that he was a very uh, 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 nice person. Uh, I learned from him that scientific greatness and fame and empathy are not mutually exclusive. And I also learned from him that never view anyone else as a competitor, but as a partner in solving some of our solutions. So I, even as a young researcher, felt to discuss with Harlan at eyesight. He never viewed me as someone who is not important, is not as good as him. And this is something in retrospective that I try to apply to my career and to the students and people I'm working with. Finally, let me end by thanking IEEE, Technical Committee of Software Engineering, uh, for giving me this award, Vic Basili and his evaluators for having nominated me, and all my wonderful peers, which whom I can't see right now, but I look forward to meeting all of you in the next couple of few of years after this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dieter. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, very insightful uh, talk and very broad. So, Forrest, uh, you want to introduce the, the, the question with the, the audience? Uh, cannot talk, they can enter their question in the chat, and both Forrest and I will help with the reading the question for Dieter. And while we wait for the first questions to come in, Dieter, I'll take the, uh, the, the prerogative here and ask you one uh, just to get things started. I, I'm, I was very curious. I mean, I, I was happy that you mentioned it, it kind of agile, you know, and how that's changing things. Um, I think one thing we often hear from some of the, the more agile aficionados is that, you know, it's, it's changing. It's a very different paradigm. It's changing everything underneath. And so I, I look at the, um, the work you've done on kind of identifying these basic principles. Uh, and I, I wonder what, if you have a reaction to that or if you have an answer. I, I think that um, it's I mean, I think over and over again. To me, as I try to outline, Agile is a special form of incremental development. With, uh, with uh, A, you have not a complete set of requirements, but you're open-ended, which creates some problems that you can create the architecture completely upfront. Yeah? Uh, and the other thing is when you look at this product model, this V model, you might do Agile and not document everything. Yeah, So uh, uh, you have a variation in terms of what you document. But in most companies I know, they have two processes. I mean, in automotive industry, I'm very much involved. They do Agile at the beginning. But once they have something which is uh, 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 going to be a cash cow, they still try to make sure that these principles are satisfied because they know exactly if they have to make changes afterwards, they kill their systems. They again create these architectures which nobody can comprehend. So I think Agile is especially important. You don't want to document everything as long as you don't even know what the customer wants, what the requirements are. And that's probably a little bit more in information systems than it is in embedded systems. Yeah? So in embedded systems, the, it's a continuum. It is a little bit more incremental development because you know most of the requirements. In information systems, is more agile uh, as we, we know it. Yeah? It's a continuum and you have to find the, the, the form that fits best with your requirements. But in the end, if you want to make money out of your system or your software without having to always invest a complete overhaul, you need to be able to apply these principles. That's the only way to make money because then you can make adjustments with minimal effort adjustments to specific requirements from customers. Otherwise, you build new systems. Yeah? So I, I don't want to see that, that a contradiction between agile, incremental, waterfall. It's basically there are different ends of the continuum. And clever software development organizations think about what's the best positioning. And the, the, the call I always apply is when you remember this picture of the uh, complex development process, that you don't have boxes that are so big and uncontrolled that rework could kill your entire project. Right. Yeah. So unfortunately, there is not a recipe. This is the best process. <laughs> unfortunately, you have to use your brain to find the one that fits your project. Thank you. 
Okay, so we, we do have some questions coming in now from the, the audience. So let me read, uh, try and read the first one here. From She says, I really like your principle. Every quality attribute is quantifiable. With machine learning, new, more abstract quality attributes such as ethics and fairness are emerging. Do you see that as a challenge, or do you still believe these quality attributes are quantifiable? No, I mean, they, they are, uh, I, I mean, ethics especially, but also maybe data privacy and things like this become more and more important since software is an integral part of our life, of our activities, because then we have to apply the same uh, criteria like ethics. We have currently here in Kaiserslautern established the Ethics in Technology, a technical area center, where we really focus on this. What does it mean to behave ethically when you develop software for different domains, like the health domain, like the automotive domain, and so on. But, I mean, you still have to be able to define what you mean by ethics. Yeah? And if you precisely define it, it's quantified. Otherwise, it's just a qualitative label and everybody makes out of it what they think. Yeah? Like even, uh, let's say, uh, easy, ease, ease of use looks like it's hard, hard to uh, quantify. But in some sense, you can say for each system, if you have a certain uh, set of use cases for, from the customer point of view, how long does it take, for instance, to use that without handbook, without making mistakes? Yeah, and that you can actually apply in a pre-release uh, experiment and you can follow up during uh, 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 use of that system, operational use. And the most important thing is, first of all, we agree what we mean. And secondly, we can improve it if we find out it doesn't live up to what we expect. Yeah, because easy ease of use otherwise is something everybody would probably assign uh, something or um, interpret something different. So that when the, the core statement is, if you can't quantify it, you can't engineer it. I, I'm sorry. No? I mean, there is no way to guarantee achievement of something. You can tell me what it is. <laughs> so then I was going to ask just a, as a quick follow-up. I mean, you, you made the excellent point there about you know what we mean by ethics being something that maybe is in the eye of the beholder. You know, So we need to have that discussion to say, what, what is it that we're really talking about? And since you mentioned automotive, I was wondering, I mean, is it, do you, in your experience at least, is it feasible to do this kind of in a domain by domain? I mean, could we say for, for automotive, this means and have that discussion as a meaningful one, or, or does it have to be system by system? Where, where do I you mean, think we can attract I, I, I think there is commonalities, of course, across in terms of data privacy. Mm -hmm. But the concrete uh, instance, what data privacy means, depends on the machines and in the end, people involved. Who could be affected in a negative way by the system? Yeah? And that defines what you need in terms of data privacy, what you need in terms of, I know, safety, whatever it may be. Yeah? So there are general categories. I mean, ACM has published many years, uh, several years ago a list of uh, ethical uh, uh, guidelines. Yeah? So in general, yes, but in its concrete instance, what kind of data privacy? It depends on the specific context of a system because that tells you what negative impact you could create otherwise. I mean, I, by the way, I'm currently working also with the city as a CDO. So you can see since I'm retired, I have more jobs than before. But uh, the, the downside is I'm not getting paid for it. But uh, here we try to build systems that are used from a heterogeneous set of the entire population. And here you will find out that defining these criteria what does it mean, acceptance, ease of use, uh, 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 ethical uh, uh, data privacy is even more complex because the, the, the group or the population of users is so diverse that it's very hard to find a common sense or common denominator. Okay, thank you. So I do, I do want to get to, uh, we have a question from Lutz uh, Preckout here. So I, he says, I agree with intellectual control as a goal. But how incomplete does it become as a solution if it cannot be achieved because of constant change and the impossibility of complete knowledge about project status? Yeah. I mean, first, first, first of all, uh, that's why I said this V model is a product model. In the end, it has to be consistent. If you have lots of changes, I mean, of course, you have rework. But even if you have lots of rework, it's easier if you uh, uh, adhere to some of these uh, regulations, like look at the refinement tree for according to functional semantics. If now the top specification, what I call H, is changing, 
I can trace where this change has an effect. I say, even if I have lots of changes, especially then these kind of divide and conquer and traceability based approaches give me more guidance. I would almost argue if I have a project where never anything changes, it's less important than in projects where it constantly changes because it gives you guidance what the impact of changes are in your already existing software. Yeah? And in the end, whether you develop, develop it in an evolutionary sense, whether you develop it top down, bottom up, in the end, vertical traceability, horizontal traceability, uh, complex, uh, uh, complex reduction uh, or modularization, whatever you want to call it, yeah? so you can actually reason about individual pieces is important. Yeah, and the more change you have, I mean, I think that's one thing we learned. The more rigor is important to not lose control as you perform these changes. So I think it's it's a wrong thinking to believe because we change things often. We should do it in a less controlled way. Thank you, Dieter. We have just a few minutes left. By the way, there's also studies that uh, uh, show this. I mean, most of these statements. Uh, uh, by now, that's the funny part, and it's partly also in this book. You can see that there is no environment where you have contradictory results. So everybody who has analyzed it comes to the same conclusion. And still, in every organization I go, they raise this issue again. Yeah. I, I know the discussion of, about documentation, but, uh, I mean, and I'm, I agree. Documentation is sometimes we are creating documentation just for the sake of documentation, which is nonsense. For instance, non-traceable documentation is for the wastebasket. Yeah. The first thing I do in a company, I say, show me your requirements, your architecture, and your code. And then I take two fingers, one in the requirement space, and say, you show me what. That should be easy if it's traceable. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, it's not. And so the connection between these three levels of documentation doesn't exist. So who could be surprised that developers, when they change something, don't change it consistently? Mm -hmm. Then we create these inconsistent kinds of representations, which create more confusion. Smart programmers understand this, and they don't even rely on documentation for that reason. But that's basically the, the right conclusion for the wrong reason. Yeah, because uh, if, if it's traceable, it's helpful. We have done so many studies in uh, university environment, student environments and practice where we have given us, uh, people several changes to perform in a context where you have this traceability and uh, divide and conquer or not. And there is orders of magnitude of difference in terms of effectiveness, which means to me making the change correctly, and efficiency, which means how much time it takes. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that Within the next decades, we educate only software developers who at least know these body of knowledge results. Because the difference is I don't want someone, I don't do it. I want someone, if I don't do it, I have a good reason. That's okay. Yeah? But if a system fails and people die and you have not applied the body of knowledge in any other discipline, you go to jail. And I believe because software is getting so important, we have to create the same awareness. If you don't do the things that we know work, then you have no uh, uh, justification to say it's not my fault. If you say we don't need it because it's less complex, then you take the risk if something happens. If a civil engineer builds a large building and says, I don't do a static analysis because I know this works, First of all, I don't think any engineer would be so crazy. But if he would be that crazy and the building falls down, I guarantee you he's in jail. Well, thank you, Dieter. I think we're down to our last uh, 30 seconds here. So before we end, I just wanted to remind our listeners that there is a separate um, uh, Get to Know Dieter Rombach session coming up. So if we didn't get to some of the questions, I think there'll be a chance to ask them there. Um, but I just wanted to say again, thank you. I think, well, first off, thank you for ending on that note because I think reminding people of the fact that we essentially live in software these days, uh, that it's it's everywhere and that there are implications and impacts to what we're doing here that are important, I think is a great note to end on. 
So thank you again, Dieter. Thank you for the time today, and, and thank you for all that you've done to, to get this award. I, w I just want to say one final thing. The most impressive thing to me is that I was able to work for 40 years in a fun community. Yeah. And <laughs>